Okay. So um, I've just heard the, the 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 recording indicator, so I assume that means it's uh, it's good to go. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do, of course, is is say thank you to Jacob for organizing this. Um, it's fantastic that um, we're able to get together uh, despite the despite the circumstances outside, and um, I'm I'm really looking forward to to talking about this with you. And um, I wanted to just say something about how my paper sort of fits into what's already been said. Um, so. Uh, Eric Curiel started off with a multifaceted probe of the implications of singularities and how to tell whether they involve a breakdown of GR or really cool new physics. And then Mina Himwich was, uh, gave us a beautiful and detailed picture of how the Event Horizon Telescope could illuminate the physics of black holes at greater resolution in the future. And so um, my paper is going to focus on, in some ways, a much smaller topic uh, namely the role of parameters in black hole astronomy. Um, but I want to persuade you that this is an interesting topic <laughs> and that it's in fact um, central to the question of, um, in, uh, of some of the aspects of how um, experiments, some of the exciting new experiments that are being done and observations and detections are linked to potential changes to the theory or, or um, potential rigorous and what Karl Popper called severe tests. Um, of the theory of GR. And so as uh, Eric Curiel's talk made clear, um, one of the things that uh, we want to do is um, with the theory, even one that's as well supported as general relativity is uh, subject it to the hardest, the hardest and the most difficult um, testing that's possible. And one of the ways in which to do that is to, is to compare a theory with uh, other candidates or other rival theories. And um, so one of the things that I want to look at in, in my talk in a minute is at how parameters are used in measurement and detection, like the, the, you know, the well-known um, LIGO detection of uh, black hole mergers and, and neutron star mergers versus in testing and comparison of theories. Um, and I'll be focusing in particular on two recent parameterized theories of GR or parameterized versions of general relativity, both of which are intended to build broader frameworks for testing the theory against rival theories of gravity, um, and both focusing on gravitational wave astronomy. So um, one of them I've talked about before. So if you've seen me talk, uh, give talks before, you've probably heard about this one. Um, it comes from uh, Nicolas Yunus and, and Franz Pretorius. Another one is new, um, and I'm going to talk about it for the first time today. Um, and it comes from Mukherjee, Vandelt, and Silk. It was uh, really just published in 2021. Um, and this one is going to be, uh, is, is really interesting and exciting, I think, because it's, uh, it's sort of breaking new ground in this, in this regard. And so I'm going to talk about these two ways of, of using um, sort of parameterizations of general relativity, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, in a minute. But so the overall focus of my talk is the role of parameters in building a framework for theory testing and comparison in gravitational wave astronomy. And by the way, for some of you who uh, saw me give a talk in Bonn last week, the, you're gonna, you're go some of this is gonna feel familiar to you and then it'll all of a sudden be very different. So, so just, uh, just give it a minute, okay. Um, so first of all, I want to talk, um, just start overall by talking about uh, the focus of my talk, which is the um, laser interferometer gravitational wave astronomy or, uh, or the LIGO um, operated by Caltech and, and MIT, which has been, this is no news to anyone here. It's been acclaimed as confirming Einstein's prediction a century ago that gravitational waves propagating as ripples in space time would be detected. Um, this paper, along with all of the work that I do does not question the idea that there that a signal has been detected or multiple signals have been detected, but rather we'll investigate how data and methods in gravitational wave astrophysics astrophysics are used as a platform for future scientific investigation and testing of general relativity. Um, so as is well known, general relativity is not the only candidate theory of gravitation. Um, I'm not going to read all of the candidates on the screen, but um, there are multiple others. Um, and we're going to talk in a moment about how um, uh, the probes in gravitational wave astronomy can be used 
as tests of these theories. And there are, there are multiple ways that have been proposed. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's worth sort of pointing out that general relativity as theories go is one of the best uh, confirmed. Um, it's been subjected to a battery of tests um, through solar system, binary pulsar, and cosmological observations. Um, there are the well-known Hulse and Taylor observations from back in the 70s um, that, that uh, were the first sort of indirect detection of gravitational waves. And then of course the recent LIGO results. Um, these earlier results, however, and this is a quote on the screen from a paper by Yunus, Yagi, and Pretorius, um, can't effectively probe the strong field regime where the gravitational field is strong and dynamical, the curvature of space-time is large, and characteristic velocities are comparable to the speed of light. And this is uh, also what uh, in the, the previous talk was uh, discussing. Um, and Yunus, Yagi, and Pretorius argued that the LIGO results allow for just that kind of probing of the strong field regime. Um, the results of the detection of gravitational waves are often cited as a confirmation in the philosophical sense of the predictions of general relativity. And here I want to give a shout out. I think I don't, I'm not sure whether Jamie was able to stay because she's, I think she's in New Zealand, <laughs> but um, Jamie Elder's um, gravitational, sorry, um, PhD dissertation. I keep using the, the, the word gravitational all the time. Um, it's called the epistemology of gravitational wave astrophysics. Um, and deals with exactly the epistemological questions that arise um, when we're talking about um, the, the issues that arise from uh, the detection of black hole mergers. Um, my talk is going to focus on a related question, um, but it's going to uh, focus on the question of finding ways to put theories to the test. So finding, in particular, even though we might think that general relativity um, is an extremely well-confirmed theory, Nonetheless, it's incredibly important to find ways to test it, to find ways that it might break down. So this is where um, this, my talk uh, has a connection with the first talk from Eric Curiel. Um, theory analysis, when we're looking for confirmation, might be distinct, at least practically, from how we analyze a theory or how we um, put, put together a framework um, when looking to test a theory or to compare it with other theories. Um, so if we want to say, for instance, are these two theories sort of observationally equivalent or are they sort of confirmed by the same data? Or is there some set of data that could be a test of this theory where if it's true, um, then another theory is false, right? Um, we might want to find a way to analyze um, theories in order to be able to set up a framework for testing that lets us do that, um, draw those kinds of inferences. And sometimes the same empirical and formal methods that are used to confirm a theory are needed to investigate how to make it a better framework for testing and comparison of theories. Um, so I want to say something very quickly, and this will be this will not be a uh, and and this has been covered by others in in this session, and this will not be news to anyone. Um, so I'll just be very quick. I want to say something quickly about the methods that are uh, used by the LIGO collaboration, um, multi messenger astronomy is the search for signals from astronomical events by using multiple sites of detection, searching for signals from a target system and some other source. Um, the use of multiple sources allows for triangulation of the signal and improves inferences from data. Um, LIGO is well known for having investigated black hole mergers, the mergers of black holes and neutron stars and neutron star mergers. And also recently as, as is um, becoming more known, um, objects in the mass gap, which are uh, sometimes referred to as mystery objects, which we won't really talk about much today, but are fascinating. Um, and in, if we want to talk about um, the merger of massive objects, generally speaking, these are divided into three stages. Um, the first is the in-spiral stage, in which the black holes or other objects come within each other's gravitational fields and begin to spin around each other more and more quickly. Um, so the in-spiral stage is fairly well modeled and can be solved, right? So um, it's, it's a stage that's it's, it's compared to the other, compared to the merger stage especially, um, it's sort of better, more tractable. Um, the merger stage is where kind of all hell breaks loose, um, the black holes coalesce, and it's kind of more difficult to model what's going on. Um, there are different ways of, of um, 
of, of modeling the merger stage. Um, and then in the ring down stage, the black holes have merged and the dynamics are now approximately those of one body because you've, even though there's, you know, some uh, um, irregularity, there's um, effectively now there's, there's one, one astronomical body. This is a picture, um, it's an official a sort of picture from the LIGO collaboration of these three stages that I was discussing. This is the in-spiral stage. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but anyway, um, the in-spiral stage is labeled and then the merger and then the ring down. Um, I mean, we can see your cursor just so you know. You can see it? Okay. Clearly, yep. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and the, um, the bottom part of this, of this graph uh, is the corresponding signal from the LIGO interferometers. Um, the red line is from the Hanford Washington um, Observatory and the blue line is from the Livingston, Louisiana Observatory. And these are the uh, well-known chirping signals. Um, chirping mean, meaning that the frequency of the signal increases sharply um, from the, the LIGO detectors. And this is, uh, this is from the first detection, um, GW15914. Um, and so this is a, um, this is basically just a representation of what the, um, the detection is going to look like of a merger where the in-spiral looks about like this, the merger looks about like this, and this is the ring down where you've basically got um, one body. Okay. So um, just to say something briefly about the methods of <clears throat> that LIGO is using that I'm going to be talking about um, in somewhat more detail in a minute. Um, those who are studying black hole dynamics and the systems, um, the, the binary black hole systems have developed multiple methods of confirming detections of black holes using data from interferometers, um, which Mina described earlier. Um, simulated waveforms using estimates of the system parameters are used to construct a signal space that's covered by a minimal state of candidate waveforms, set, sorry, of candidate waveforms, after which the candidate waveforms are used for matched filtering. Now, we can talk about this more in the question session. I'm just giving a sort of overview at this point. Um, but um, to my mind, one of the best sources uh, to learn what's going on um, in this particular uh, arena is Capano et al. Uh, from 2016. Um, where they describe template-based searches and how, um, how this is all going to work. Um, but basically the idea is um, if before, um, and this is something that I, I've always found very evocative and, and interesting, um, before looking for, um, before, before arguing that you can detect a waveform just in very simple terms, um, you have to kind of construct a simulated waveform that's going to correspond in um, certain specific ways with what you're looking for. And so the candidate waveforms are um, constructed using um, what we're going to talk about in a moment, using hypothetical system parameters. And so those are going to be um, system parameters that you say, well, if there were a system that did have the following um, parameters, where these parameters are going to be properties of the origin system, so mass of black holes, um, the, what's called the chirp mass, um, you know, the orbital period, the orbital frequency, et cetera, um, those sort of hypothetical parameters um, then become part of the generation of template banks that are then um, the way that uh, these candidate waveforms are generated that will then be selected from um, in the post data analysis. Um, okay, I hope I'm not going too fast, but... Um, so hypothetical um, physical, so I want to make a distinction here between hypothetical and um, estimated physical parameters of the source systems. Okay, so um, hypothetical physical parameters are when physical reasoning is used to simulate binary black hole systems and to construct hypothetical waveforms that might be detected as emanating from systems with specific physical parameters. Um, so when a single waveform is selected for confirmation from the template bank based on the data, the likelihood ratio is used to confirm that particular waveform as evidence for the detection of a system with these specific physical parameters. Um, and so I'm referring to this um, set of parameters as hypothetical because um, the idea is that when these parameters are used to generate template banks, those, um, those physical properties of the system have not yet been observed. 
they've just been sort of speculatively, well, maybe there's a there's a system of this particular kind out there. And so we're going to use it to, to simulate um, a system with those properties. But then once a waveform has been selected as the one that is the most likely um, out of the candidate set, out of this, this space of, of possible waveforms, um, then that one is inferred at, or selected as the best confirmed from the template bank. And then that is the one that is considered to be detected. Right? Um, and this, there's, there's quite a lot to be said about exactly how this works. I'm obviously looking at this from a, uh, sort of 30,000 feet above. Um, but the estimation of the physical parameters of the system is done in post data analysis, right? So the idea is that once you've detected a particular uh, system with particular um, uh, uh, parameters, then you can argue that those physic that those parameters are are estimated physical parameters. And so if you look at the at the um, papers that Abbott et al. that the, the LIGO collaboration has published, um, then the inference is made from the detected waveform to estimates of the parameters of the source system. So in this case, what, what's happening is that the parameters are then considered to be actual parameters of a real origin system, right? So instead of saying these are parameters that would exist of a system that, that we speculate or hypothesize, the argument is um, these are the real parameters of an actual system. Um, and so um, the, the waveform in that case that's selected as the best candidate is then used as evidence for an inference to the properties of the system that's sort of out there. Um, this has obvious philosophical interest as um, the basis of, for instance, an argument to the uh, existence of systems with real properties, right? Um, this is something that, that we might want to talk about. Um, I also want to point out that the LIGO collaboration has been incredible about providing um, open source and sort of um, bespoke, tailored um, methods for post data analysis um, that they encourage and indeed train uh, everyone uh, to be able to use and to verify for themselves. And so I think this is this is really something I don't want to sound like a commercial for, for the LIGO collaboration, but this is really something that, um, that they've really done um, really admirably and, and in a way that should be a paradigm for, for other people. So the first um, case study of looking at a um, parameterized version of general relativity that I want to look at, um, and I'm going to say what I mean by parameterized in a second, is the so-called parameterized post-Einsteinian framework from Nicholas Yunus and Franz Pretorius. And here my, um, my source is a paper called Fundamental Theoretical Bias in Gravitational Wave Astrophysics and the Parameterized Post-Einsteinian Framework, which is exactly what it says it is. Um, they are going to provide, what Yunus and Pretorius are going to do is identify um, what they call a fundamental bias. Um, in the methods that are used in gravitational wave astrophysics. Now, a historical point that I want to make is that Franz Pretorius is responsible for many of the methods <laughs> that he's criticizing here in this paper, or, or at least some of them, right? So this is kind of a, you know, he's kind of saying like, look, this is what was needed in order to be able to arrive at these detections in the first place. But nonetheless, it's, it's worth recognizing that these methods will, will in some ways sort of build in um, what he calls a fundamental theoretical bias, or I mean, in maybe less kind of derogatory language, you could just say a, a set of presuppositions or assumptions that are kind of baked into the methodology. And so Pretorius and Eunice are going to say in this paper that I'm citing from, um, systematic errors created by fundamental bias may be as large as, if not larger than, those induced by modeling bias. Waveforms could deviate from the general relativity prediction dramatically in the dynamical strong field if GR doesn't adequately describe a system. This is particularly worrisome for template-based searches, as the event that will be described to a detection will be the member of the template bank with the largest signal-to-noise ratio. Given that GR is quite well tested, Many sources can't have deviations so far from GR as to prevent detection with GR templates. And then this is the most important sentence here. If templates are used based solely on GR models, although the corresponding events may be heard, 
Any unexpected information the signals may contain about the nature of gravity will be filtered out. Um, and so let's just um, talk a moment about what they mean by this. Um, the problem is the ability of template-based searches of the kind that I just described to detect potential deviations from the theory of general relativity. So ways in which the detected waveform um, may contain, as they say, unexpected information um, that's not predicted by the theory. And the overall goal of um, Unis and Pretorius or, and of their um, sort of framework for theory testing is to make the theory as open to testing as possible, right? As, as, as open to detecting um, deviations from the theory as possible. Um, so what's the problem from that perspective? Um, Template-based searches use matched filtering to select the best candidate waveform from a signal space that's been covered ahead of time with a minimal set of possible waveforms generated using a mixture of um, methods of simulation, we'll just say shortly. The worrying possibility is that an event with a signal to noise ratio that's picked up by the template-based search will be close to the predictions of general relativity, but the ways in which it deviates from GR will be masked by the templates themselves. So if the theoretical assumptions derived from GR are incorrect as descriptions of the detected system, then there will still be a signal that's detected, but the conclusions drawn from it will be inaccurate or it'll actually mask information that's coming from the system. Um, so for instance, and this is going to be important for um, the, uh, as sort of an overall point in, in what I'm discussing, there might be a signal that's detected but parsed as a weak signal using the current templates and the system might be inferred to be distant because the signal is weak. If the signal is a strong signal that's actually inconsistent with general relativity, they're going to argue it may be much closer. And in this paper from 2009, Eunice and Pretorius observed that this is a real possibility given the assumptions made in template-based searches. So they propose what's called the parametrized post-Einsteinian framework, um, which is a version of Will and Norbeth's uh, parametrized post-Newtonian framework to address this issue. I think I added a parameterize there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think it's just the post-Newtonian approximation. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm adding in parameters where they don't belong. Um, so the PPE framework, the parameterized post-Einsteinian framework, is intended to be close enough to general relativity to be able to analyze the data properly, but at the same time to be able to measure what they call generic deviations from the predictions of general relativity. And I want to note here that in a recent paper, um, Eric Curiel has made a distinction between abstract equations, generic physical systems, and concrete and individual models that I see as kind of closely tracking this, the idea of generic um, that uh, Eunice and Pretorius are going to point out here. But I can't uh, follow this up more, but maybe later on in the questions. So I want to say something quickly before I move on to talking more about what's meant by the PPE framework to make, to point out that, and I know this is gonna seem somewhat dizzying, the PPE framework actually uses parameters in a third way. So we've talked about hypothetical uh, parameters that are used to generate simulated waveforms. Physical parameters that are inferred from the selected waveforms or detected waveforms um, their, their properties of the origin system. But when um, Eunice and Pretorius and when um, Mukherjee et al. later in the talk use the term parameter or a parameterized theory, they're actually using it in a third way. Um, what they're talking about is um, what they call descriptive or what I might call generic parameters. Um, and here, unfortunately, I'm using the term generic parameters and computer science already has the term generic parameter. Um, I think though it's used in kind of the same way, so I'm gonna steal it. Um, but so descriptive or generic parameters are gonna be um, a set of parameters used to build a class of generic structures for testing, or at least so I will argue that this is actually a third way of using um, parameters in theory testing and comparison. So this should be used, um, this term should be understood like when you talk about a parameterized model in statistics, where you take something that's a substantive variable or a measured quantity and you replace it with a parameter. You say, let's call 
gamma, <laughs> right? The entire range of, of you know, this particular feature of the theory, for instance. Um, so if you look at um, a normal linear regression, for instance, it's often gonna look something like alpha one plus, you know, beta zero plus beta one plus some error, ter error term equals X or something like that, right? And there the betas and alphas are parameters that are gonna measure um, what it is that you're looking for. Um, so in the cases that I'm going to be looking at, um, the parameters that are used stand in for physical features of the source system, mass, spin, frequency, orbital period, and so forth, or for formal assumptions of the model, they might stand in, um, we're gonna see in a minute, there's something called the frictional term um, that's being measured in Mukherjee et al. Um, so they might stand in for, for instance, dynamical assumptions that a particular dynamical equation will, will obtain and so forth. Um, so this use of parameters um, is often not distinguished, in my view, carefully enough from other uses of the term parameter, right? So um, this, this is something that I really want to kind of focus on is what do we mean when we um, talk about descriptive or generic parameters and how can that be used to build a broader framework for theory testing? Um, so how is the parameterized post-Einsteinian framework set up? Uh, well, what Eunice and Pretorius are going to do is take the theoretical language and substantive predictions of GR, replace them with more general formalisms that appeal to known functions, that replace variables with parameters in the way that I was just generally describing, and in general that replace the GR strong field equations and structure with a broader scaffolding that doesn't assume that GR is the case, right? So there's there's going to be a way of, um, and I, I, I'm not going to go into the details of any of this, but we can talk about it later again. Um, there's going, the idea will be that you replace certain features of the theory, you begin with GR, and then you sort of build out from it to replace certain of the more specific features of the theory with generic structures that allow for the possibility at least that other theories um, are accurate as descriptions of the system. Um, once the key equations are replaced with their parameterized forms, the PPE framework can be put together. Uh, the main virtue of using this framework is that if it's used for post-detection data analysis, ideally, it would catch the cases of interest to Eunice and Pretorius where a detection is made, but the data contain information that's inconsistent with general relativity. And I just wanna point out that um, Hedda Patel, uh, who I worked with for a while, um, provides a recent set of computational methods for post-data analysis using the PPE formula, uh, formalism and has done a set of initial searches in this way in her MS thesis. Okay, so now for something completely different. <laughs> um, I want to say something about another, um, so the PPE program is going, the PPE formalism is going to be building um, a set of parameterized models within the theory of general relativity in order to broaden um, the ability of the theory to engage in post data analysis with the LIGO data. Um, now I wanna look at a different um, proposal for a parameterized um, sort of version of general relativity that's been made recently by um, Mukherjee and Vondelt and Silk in, a in this uh, new 2021 paper. And so what, what Mukherjee et al. are going to do is something that's actually completely different. And they're going to use, um, they're going to be building off of a really cool um, sort of history of using black holes as what are called standard sirens. And I think um, uh, this terminology is actually um, owed, I, I believe, to um, partly to someone who's uh, possibly here, um, and I'll mention that in a second. Um, so the, this research program of looking at standard sirens comes from a, an initial really cool paper by Bernard Schutz from 1986, determining the Hubble constant from gravitational wave observations, which is about determining the Hubble constant from gravitational wave observations. And it's part of a, um, a research program to use gravitational waves to measure the Hubble constant. Um, and more recently, um, Daniel Holtz and Scott Hughes in 2005 
have proposed um, using the in spiral um, of gravitational waves, which we talked about a minute ago, um, as a kind of standard siren. So what's meant by a standard siren? Um, well, there's an idea of a uh, standard candle that um, is an object that has um, a luminosity that can be used, it's an optical luminosity that can be used as a kind of constant or standard um, of measurement. Um, and Holtz and Hughes suggest using the gravitational wave driven in spiral of massive binary black holes as a standard for measurement in a similar way, right? So using the in spiral phase of black hole mergers as a kind of standard for measurement because it's so well known and well um, and can be used as a, as a kind of as a kind of standard. Um, and they remark in this paper, as gravitational wave detections can be thought of as oral rather than optical, a more appropriate term for a gravitational wave standard candle is a standard siren. And this term was suggested by Stroll Fenny and uh, Sean Carroll. Um, Holtz and Hughes remark, um, since gravitational waves don't provide the redshift of the source, binary black hole gravitational wave measurements alone don't probe the relation between distance and redshift. But as first noted by Bernard Schutz in the paper that was just cited, if some kind of electromagnetic counterpart to a binary black hole gravitational wave event should be identified, the situation changes drastically. First, by determining the source position, many correlations that set the distance error are broken and the error then drops immensely. Second, a counterpart could determine the source's redshift. So a binary black hole gravitational wave source coupled with an EM counterpart could therefore constitute an exceedingly good standard siren. Um, so this is, the, this is the general idea behind the methodology that Holtz and Hughes are going to propose. Um, so the original use for standard sirens, uh, as, as mentioned just now, was to measure the Hubble constant. Um, but of course, once you have a standard siren, you can use it for other purposes, including um, as is proposed now, testing the theory of general relativity against other candidates. So this is where I'm going to cite this recent paper by Mukherjee et al. that proposes a parameterized framework to test for deviations from the predictions of general relativity against alternative theories of gravity using standard sirens and using another set of uh, measurements as a standard. Okay, so the idea behind this is going to be um, to build a framework for comparing general relativity to other candidate theories of gravity. And so this is exactly the kind of, uh, the kind of thing that Eunice and Pretorius were doing and that I'm interested in is this question of how to find a basis for comparison. Okay, so how is this going to work? This is the paper, um, Mukherjee, Vondelt, and Silk, testing the general rel th theory of relativity using gravitational wave propagation from dark standard sirens. Um, and I just, um, this isn't, this isn't a, I just want to stop here and make a, a, a small point, which is that as a philosopher, I really appreciate um, scientific paper titles that actually say what they're about. Philosophy papers never actually say what they're about. <laughs> but um, <laughs> this is actually what this paper is about. Okay. Um, so this appeared in monthly notices of the Royal Astro Astronomical Society. Okay. So what is, what, what is the, um, What's the methodology that Mukherjee et al. are going to propose? Well, first of all, GR predicts a unique ge geodesic for electromagnetic and gravitational wave signals. Um, but as they point out, several of the alternative theories of gravity predict deviations from the general theory by having a difference in the speed of propagation between gravitational wave and EM signals. Due to the non-zero mass of the graviton, the running of the effective Planck mass, also Planck mass, sorry, also called the frictional term, and the anisotropic source term. Okay, so the idea is that there might, there are the alternative theories of gravity are going to actually predict not a unique geodesic, but a difference in the, uh, in the, in the speed. So um, Mukherjee et al. identify in their analysis of um, GR and the predictions that it makes in this realm, a frictional term gamma Z that if general relativity is correct, will be zero. Um, and as you can see from before, um, the frictional term is the running of the effective Planck mass. Um, and the idea behind this is going to be that this is a, um, this is something that if GR is correct, it's going to be zero. 
um, if the alternative candidate theories of gravity are correct, it's not. This won't necessarily, and this is something that, um, again, we can talk about in more detail later, this won't necessarily tell um, which candidate theory is correct, but any non-zero measurement is going to be at least prima facie evidence that we should be looking um, for some deviation from GR in this particular case. Um, now, Mukherjee et al. are going to argue that the effect of this frictional term gamma z is going to lead to a modified luminosity distance to the gravitational wave source that's situated at a certain redshift. The modification of the luminosity distance, this is a, just a quote from them, um, for the gravitational waves can be larger or smaller than the EM luminosity distance for different theories of gravity. Now, one initial problem is that the parameter gamma z is degenerate with the electromagnetic luminosity distance and hence with other cosmological parameters. So they're going to say, well, if only there were some independent way um, to measure this, uh, if there were an independent probe of the EM luminosity distance from electromagnetic observables, this would be useful for breaking the degeneracy between the cosmological parameters and the parameters re related to alternative theories of gravity. They're going to say, well, there actually is an independent way of measuring the electromagnetic luminosity distance. And that's through its relation to what's called the angular diameter distance or the geometric distance. And this is measured with reference to the baryon acoustic oscillation scale or BAO or bow scale. Um, Okay, so this is one of the measures of the overall distribution of matter and radiation. It's a cosmological measure. It is, just to bring up yet another standard, a standard ruler um, that measures angular diameter distance and expansion rate as a function of redshift. It's a measure of the effect of dark energy on the expansion rate of the universe. And this is why Mukherjee et al. call this the, a dark standard siren, right? So this is an overall measurement. So they will conclude from their analysis that this relation shows that the product of the BAO angular scale and the gravitational wave luminosity distance measure the frictional term gamma z as a function of redshift. So the concordance between the electromagnetic geometric probes and the gravitational wave luminosity probes allows a way to test the theory of gravity because if there's a difference between the two measurements, that's at least prima facie evidence that GR is incorrect in this particular uh, case. So what exactly do I mean to, to be pointing out by um, bringing up all of this information from this paper? Well, the concerns of Yunus and Pretorius include the possibility that, uh, that GR, sorry, uh, general relativity is incorrect and that scientists could be misjudging the distance of black hole systems from the observer, right? The dark standard siren approach of Mukherjee, Wandelt, and Silk proposes using another standard to determine the EM luminosity distance, right? And so finding an independent probe, an independent way of looking at the distance. Um, they also argue that comparing the EM and GW luminosity provides an independent way to test the validity of GR against alternative theories of gravity. I want to point out a couple of things. Um, first of all, it's interesting to note that both of these approaches are noting um, the importance of, of the distance um, of the system from the observer. But secondly, I want to just point out that both systems are actually going to, um, are going to use parameters <laughs> and are going to, to explicitly um, use what they call a parameterized theory in order to construct a test of general relativity, right? So the idea behind this is that if you come up with a parameter that if, for instance, if GR is correct will be zero, and if it's incorrect will be some measurable magnitude, then that's something that can show sort of um, just, that's a, that is as good as you could ask for. <laughs> of a sort of standard Popperian test of the hypothesis that um, the theory is incorrect in a particular case, right? Um, or at least evidence that it should be investigated further. 
Um, and the way that this is the way that this framework for testing is set up is by using parameters in order to generate a kind of broader framework for testing. Um, both Eunice and Pretorius and Mukherjee, Wandelt, and Silk use parameterized versions of GR to build testing frameworks. They identify parameters that are generic or descriptive in the sense that they describe generic ways that the theories might differ rather than providing specific hypotheses or estimated values. So they don't say, we think that gamma Z is going to be five, right? Um, they say, this is something that if GR is correct, it will be constant or zero. If it's incorrect, there will be a certain measurement. Um, and what's informative is not the specific value, but the, dis the difference from the predictions of the theory that's being tested. Okay, um, so let me just summarize quickly um, what I wanted to discuss today. And um, first of all, uh, I wanna point out that LIGO modeling methods um, to date have understandably been geared towards detection and confirmation since that's the goal um, and that's, <laughs> incredibly difficult. Um, Eunice and Pretorius have cautioned that a fundamental bias may be present in the uh, waveform analysis methods, the template-based searches due to the assumption of GR's correctness that's built in. They argue that a framework for testing generic deviations from GR's predictions is needed, and they propose the parameterized post-Einsteinian framework. Mukherjee, Vondelt, and Silk recently have proposed another approach using uh, using the BAO scale, the Baryon uh, Acoustics Observation Scale, to measure possible distant differences, sorry, between the electromagnetic and gravitational wave luminosity distance. What are the implications of this? What are the sort of, this is, uh, this is a workshop on implications of black holes, so what are the implications of, of what's been said? Um, well, if we focus on the ways in which the theory can be tested and the ways in which the theory needs, uh, the ways in which general relativity needs to be sort of put to the test um, by observational data, experimental data, this reveals the need for a broader framework, not just of the theory, but of the way the theory is related to data and models. I would argue that the role of parameters in theory testing, even in confirmation and also in comparing theories to each other deserves much more analysis than it's been given so far, at least in philosophy. Um, parameters are used to make hypotheses or to arrive at confirmed estimates via parameter estimation. But I want to argue that this is actually quite different from the use of descriptive or generic parameters. Um, the, and I want to argue that the latter should receive more attention as it's crucial to the process of theory testing and comparison. And I've tried to give uh, two specific examples of how this has been used, of how um, the proposing of, of sort of generic parameters for, uh, to build a broader theory, um, to, uh, to build a broader sort of theoretical framework for testing has actually been done in the past. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks so much. That was a wonderful talk. All right. So we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, please use the hand raising tool. Or again, you can put your questions in the chat window and I'll read them. Uh, again, we'll have a few minutes for questions now, then we'll take a brief break. And then we'll have a full hour for questions uh, starting um, in at my clock in about 15 minutes. Uh, in Eastern Standard Time, that's three o'clock to four o'clock and we'll conclude at four o'clock. All right, I see a bunch of hands. The first hand I saw was from Shannon. Shannon, do you wanna ask your question, please? Yeah, thanks, Lydia. I really love that talk. And uh, I found it particularly interesting because it's uh, integrated with a lot of the things that I'm working on in my dissertation. So the question that I wanna ask um, is more of a practical one. Um, how is it that these researchers or that you are thinking about deploying this parameterized theory framework in testing? Um, in the large data sets. So are they thinking about just creating new templates for matched filtering? Are they thinking about these more avant-garde artificial intelligence techniques like convolutional neural networks? Is there something that would work better? Um, but like, is there a better dis uh, distinction between the two of them? So that's what I wanna know. Yeah, well, that's a great question and I, I... So I should say something before uh, before answering any of the questions, which is that you know I am a an extremely interested observer in all of this, but I, I want to sort of severely limit my uh, <laughs> my claim to authority or to know about uh, uh, about exactly what's going on, right? So so there are better um, so having 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 undermined myself thoroughly, um, let me just say that 
one of the things I want I I think is important is that um, the PPE model, the PPE framework, um, has been given some sort of computational sort of uh, um, uh, implementation. So so Patel has has done that, but uh, there have been other people, um, Ghosh et al have um, employed machine learning methods uh, using the PPE framework. And one of the cool things about the PPE framework is it's a post data analysis, right? So the idea behind it is you're, you're not necessarily constructing. Um, so, so remember like the, the whole point of it is to reveal information that might have been obscured in the first search. So you can redo the search on data that you've already got and the idea behind it is that the PPE method will hopefully broaden the um, sort of the, the the information that you can get from data that you've already got. So on the one hand, you've got to uh, use a supercomputer to do the search and so forth. Um, but on the other hand, you don't necessarily need to do a new experiment because the idea behind it, the whole idea behind it is to find um, potential deviations from the theory that might have been obscured by the initial way of of doing the post data analysis. So in that sense, it's a kind of computationally minimal um, or, or sort of experimentally minimal uh, kind of approach. Thanks. Thanks, Shannon. Um, I, I did see Carl's hand up. Uh, Carl, did you have a question? Uh, no, no. OK. Uh, Eric? Uh, th thanks, Lydia. I, I have a uh, somewhat technical question about the Mukherjee et al. paper. So, they um, you say that they that, that they're using the BAO uh, scale to, uh, to to fix essentially like uh, the geometric distance, and they're going to compare that to the lumin to the to the redshift luminosity distance. But the, um, all, all, all the models that allow one to uh, to determine B, uh, the, B, the BAO scales effectively. I'm um, assume that th that their friction parameter is zero. They effectively use GR. They compare. You know, you start you start you start with looking at the um, at the BAO scale in in CMB. You kind of you know, dynamically crank forward uh, the the dynamical ev evolution to current day. You, you compare that to looking at the, at, at kind of statistical patterns of uh, of, uh, of sound horizons in uh, in scatter in scattering of galactic distances of intergalactic distances, and all that all that kind of depends on on using GR as the dynamical cranking mechanism. So do, do they do Mukherjee at all talk about how to control for the fact that part of the, part of the data they're using was effective was effectively constrained and determined by GR as, using GR as an input? Yes. So I'm looking down and not looking at because I'm I'm looking at the paper, right? Um, so this was a part of the paper that I didn't uh, sort of get to in detail, but this is they do kind of the same thing um, that uh, that Eunice and Pretorius do, which is effectively to rewrite the theory. So they say, look, the you're not going to be able to see this, right? But um, well, maybe. <laughs> Uh, so they say, you know, here's the equation as it is in GR that, that's used to sort of roll the tape forward. And then they say, here's a parameterized uh, equation that involves gamma Z and a number of other parameters, right? And they say, so on, if, if we assume that GR is true, then all of those parameters are just going to be zero and it's just going to reduce back to the original equation. And they say, so what we need to do is actually um, add in these parameters which if GR is correct, will just be, they'll just be crossed out, right? In the, uh, they'll just be zero. Um, but we're not going to assume that they'll be zero. We're going to rewrite the equation and then that will um, be a way of rolling the tape forward. Now, how well this works, I don't know, but that's, that's exactly their kind of strategy is to say, well, look, if we, if we rewrite this equation to add in the complexity of like the additional uh, measurements that we're talking about, um, then it's just a way of um, when we're doing the experiments, we search for a deviation instead of assuming in the search that that deviation doesn't exist. Right. At least that's the that's the general idea, right? That's very cool. Okay, I I, I have to go read that paper. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. All right, are there other questions right now for Lydia? Okay. Um, if not, oh wait, Sean, Sean, you have a question. There you go. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether to do this in the general um, discussion, but maybe this is good for Lydia. I'm just trying to figure out if there's any way to, in specific or general senses, to compare different ways of testing general relativity from the things like uh, the Event Horizon Telescope to things like LIGO. Like if the metric around a spinning black hole was not exactly Kerr, where would we learn that first? Is there any notion of what that would be? That is, oh. <laughs> that is fantastic. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that's exactly the kind of, um, that is exactly the kind of um, question that's driving this, um, this set of, of inquiries, right? Because, sorry, you moved on my screen, so I'm kind of looking into right. this. Not my fault. Yeah, so I think, I think that's exactly the idea is that um, this is, this is in kind of a, a an initial phase, right? And the idea now is to say, okay, let's go back and look over the data again, um, do a post post data analysis, right? And then the goal is to be able to then identify like, okay, where are we going to be able to see the, de the deviation specifically, right? In the kind of second wave of, of looking at this. Right. And I think that would be exactly uh, the kind of thing that would that would be incredibly cool to find out is, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe the Event Horizon te Telescope can tell us in this particular case. Um, Mukherjee et al are gonna talk uh, a lot more for obvious reasons because of their cosmological focus on the uh, LISA and the sort of space-based. Um, so, so there's already some knowledge of, of sort of, okay, some of these are gonna be better suited for, for certain purposes than others. Um, but I think that's exactly the kind of question that this can can help with. Okay. So, but but as a general answer, we're not sure yet. Is the short as first. far as I know. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Sean. So, um, I think we're gonna uh, take a, a short break now, and we'll reconvene in eight minutes. Um, so, I want to thank uh, Lydia again. Uh, for your talk. And actually, I want to thank all of our speakers for, for their talks. And we'll have a, a, an hour to, to ask questions and discuss all of the talks. So hang on to your questions or think of them and, and we'll reconvene in, in seven minutes now to discuss.